Good morning and welcome to my YouTube channel everybody. For this week's video I would like to go through the process of another layout design project. In this case it is for a customer in Australia, although he does model American railroads. Now all the dimensions he's given me are in millimeters instead of inches, but I've converted them to feet and inches in most cases. Now here is the layout space that he started with. It is a room above a single store garage and it overall is about 19 foot 4 by 15 foot 9 although the stairs cut into one corner of that meaning that the width across here is only a little over 12 feet. Now for the sort of layout that he wanted that really wasn't going to be enough room to put a peninsula with a turn back curve on it. We were going to have to severely compromise either the curve radius or the aisle width or both. Well, as some of my viewers may know, I was in the building trade for about 14 years running a construction company. And during that time, I came across numerous homes where the upper floor was cantilevered a few feet out from the lower floor. And I even built one myself. So I suggested the possibility of cantilevering the room outwards, either in one or both directions. Now, I'm not sure whether such an arrangement would be allowed in Sydney, Australia, but he sent it off to his architect anyway, and it came back to the city council was not going to go for it. Apparently he had already exceeded the building to lot size ratio allowable, and they weren't going to let him increase the footprint of the structures any further. But it did get the two of them brainstorming, and eventually they came up with the idea of excavating part of the backyard and the area under the rear addition to the home to build a basement, even though there was no building above it. So this is what came back from his architect. Once again, it's in millimeters, but the layout space now equates to approximately 26 feet by 37 feet. Here is the original space now under the garage. Now this area is not available to us the majority of it is going to be occupied by a car lift so you can get two vehicles in the garage one above the other and here is the outline of the back of his home addition this area being a courtyard and this area being under his kitchen dining room and living room so now we have a good large area that is more appropriate for the sort of layout that he wants me to design for him so i drew it out in third planet to scale this still has the metric grid under it instead of the, the feet and inches, each small square being 10 centimeters and the big ones being 50 centimeters, half a meter. I suggested that we use this corner area here to put a half bathroom in so that he didn't have to keep leaving and returning to the house every couple of hours when he's down here. He already said he wanted a utility sink, so we put it under the stairs. And by getting all the utilities out of the way into this corner under the garage, we've left a nice big rectangular space for the layout. Now at this point I was assuming that we'd probably have a single beam running down the middle of it with a row of posts. Eventually once I started drawing in layout footprints it turned out that with the dimensions we had a single beam and a row of posts down the middle was going to end up wasting a lot of space. I eventually ended up with a twin beam system. Of course, with the width being only about 26 feet, we could avoid the post altogether by putting the beams across the short distance and running the joist long. Now, during the initial consultation with this customer, it came out that he really liked some of the things that I'd incorporated on my own layout. He really liked the concept of a branch line to a harbour town, especially the switch back down to the harbour, although he wanted to incorporate a double track continuous run so that he can just let the trains run while he operates the branch line. This was the first plan that I came up with for him. I've used the long straight wall here for his main junction yard, a helix down to staging, run around the end of the room and then onto an L-shaped peninsula with the end of that incorporating the second helix to complete the continuous loop and then the branch line to the harbour. I also suggested that we leave some area for a crew lounge. 
not only is this feature virtually essential if you're going to be holding group operating sessions, but also it would help to make his wife feel a lot more welcome when she comes to visit him in the train room. Now, because of the possibility that the basement might end up a slightly different size to what is currently shown on the architect's drawings, I deliberately designed it fairly loose. I started with a minimum mainline radius of 36 inches and 42 inch aisles everywhere. And although we're both hoping that we're going to get the space we've asked for to allow these generous standards to be incorporated, we should be okay if we have to shrink the plan slightly in either direction. Now, when my customer received this first rough sketch, he was very excited, not only because he loved the design concept, but also because it had been a lengthy process. Several months had elapsed between him initially hiring me and getting to the point where we had a, a space that we could design a layout for. Until then, I hadn't even had enough information to start putting lines on paper, or electronic lines in the computer, as the case may be. I got quite a lot of feedback from him over the next couple of days. Now he knew he wanted mostly diesels, but with the ability to run some steam locomotives. Originally, we thought about the possibility of designing the layout in such a way that he could have dual periods. He could have two different sets of trains for a transition period and for some time a couple of decades later, where he'd have more modern diesels. It would need certain compromises and many of the details would need changing between sessions. But it looked like there was plenty of space under the layout for huge staging yards that would allow him to store both sets of trains. But this was the point at which he decided to abandon the dual periods. He now wanted to go completely up to date. He decided he wanted me to develop the harbour as a contemporary container port. He would just run the occasional steam locomotive on a weekend excursion on an otherwise completely up-to-date layout. He also came up with a list of additional industries he wanted to include. Let's find that. In addition to the container terminal, he suggested uh, automotive manufacturing delivering to the harbour, white goods distribution, which is Australian for kitchen appliances, an ethanol plant, scrapyard, fresh food, warehouse distribution, concrete gravel plant, and he also said he wanted to avoid lumber mills and coal mines, which are kind of cliched on model railroads anyway. I went through this list with him. We decided that with the container port being the major industry on the layout, trying to fit in automotive manufacturing as well, might crowd things to the detriment of both. And because we decided on a West Coast port, most of the country's automotive manufacturing is several thousand miles away. We did decide, however, that we could have a few auto racks arriving from time to time and vehicles being shipped overseas. Now, all the other industries were fairly easy to include, and I also suggested adding propane dealers and a team track as being interesting modern industries. Now, ethanol plants are pretty large industries as well, so that was crying out for a whole town to be devoted to it. And I actually came up with the perfect location for it. So with that discussion out of the way, let's now go to the next version. Here is the same plan with the container port included and a little more detail. You can also see here how I've devised a twin beam system to support the roof of the basement with two columns on each beam. Note that the columns don't have to be evenly spaced as long as we don't overspan the main beam. Now with the desire to include a container port and intermodal yard at the harbour, I wasn't going to be able to put it on this small peninsula. It had to go along a long straight wall because that's the shape of intermodal yards. I put a harbour behind it. Now this container ship is drawn as full Panamax size, a little over a thousand feet long. Although to save width, well, the ship will be just over half width before hitting the backdrop. Now, as long as we are able to satisfactorily control viewing angles, it will be impossible to see that it's not a complete ship. We also decided that export grain elevators would be a great addition to its port. And I've included two here. There's what I've called the older elevator and a much larger 
new one. The older one on the peninsula here is a good tall building to help disguise the support post. And I came up with a plan for incorporating a pair of mirrors at either end of the scene to double the size of the container port because container terminals are huge places occupying several square miles and obviously we didn't have room for anything more than a relatively condensed rendition. Now the intermodal yard is a little on the short side but by extending the lead track around the end of the room long enough to get half a train beyond it it is possible to pull forward and then back in and double the train over into two tracks, which is a common prototype process anyway. Then there's a small general merchandise yard in front of it. And all the other features that he wanted to include from my own layout. Although in this case, we have room to make a much better job of them because we have a lot more space. I've shown one bridge location here because he asked for several significant bridges to be included in the plan. So I've shown one here and two more at this end of the room where the two routes diverge. Now the plan assumes that the double track route and the single line to the harbour were built by different companies, although in the modern period they were probably both have been swallowed up by the same regional giant. So that's the justification for having the twin bridges across this valley here and to have the two main lines paralleling each other for, for some distance. We're deliberately not expanding the main yard to fill the entire space available. We want to keep it fairly modest so as to allow room for some urban scenery around it. And also on the double track main, there is a secondary industrial area around here. And on the single track to the harbour, we have a small town, which will be designed fairly well along the lines of my own town of Centerville and my own layout. And this side of the peninsula, we're going to be using for the ethanol plant. Now, although this passing siding is a little close to the towns either side of it, we're going to get around that problem by having the ethanol plant served by a dedicated train. All other trains on the branch line will, pay, will completely ignore this town. So that way we have a good length run from the junction yard around this end here to the halfway point, And then again from that, around here to the harbour. The ethanol trains would of course run non-stop between the junction and the ethanol plant. And then if we move on to the lower deck, here is the staging level. I've shown how the helix comes in, a very large staging yard. The customer wanted to be able to incorporate trains as long as were feasible and this yard ended up about 35 feet on the longest track. So about half a scale mile. Certainly enough to look great on a double track main line. There are reversing loops at each end of the yard to allow for turning trains. And then I've shown a couple of optional additions down here. There is room to put auxiliary stub end staging along this wall here. And since we have this rather long lead in around the peninsula, it seemed a shame to keep it all hidden. So I suggested popping this main line out into view to incorporate a rural small town scene. And he loved that idea. And since this scene is completely isolated from the rest of the layout, we can do something totally different. I know of one other modeler who had a small isolated area that he finished as a snow scene. So with the rough plan accepted, now let's start filling in the details. Here we have the main level of the plan in all its scenic glory. I've given a couple of place names, Westport for the harbour and Midway for the town halfway along the branch line. I've drawn in the container ship. The intermodal yard was increased from three to four tracks wide and the general merchandise yard is also four tracks if you include the arrival departure track. And then there's a thoroughfare track in front which will also be the one that his passenger excursion comes in on. And that will lay over around this corner above the couch. I've got three stub tracks here for unloading auto racks. I've got the grain elevator tracks crossing the leads to the intermodal yard. And that area there took me forever to get it working 
with standard geometry diamond crossings. But eventually it worked perfectly. It just took a while to get the right combination. As we can see, these three tracks dive under the mirror and they can extend all the way to the corner of the room, allowing for plenty of capacity at the great elevator. At the other end, the edge of the mirror will be hidden by a power plant smokestack. Then we can arrange wind-blown smoke to hide the top of the mirror. I guess you could call that smoke and mirrors as the saying goes. I found room for two car floats instead of one. Two is always desirable because in most cases a single tug would move two floats together. And there's the smaller general merchandise harbour here. Even the small ship is around five feet long. So representing a decent sized vessel. And I've shown how one of the general merchandise warehouses can be cut off at the front here, allowing the interior to be shown in, in full detail where it can easily be seen. Notice how the bridge over the river here has two tracks behind it. This is not the same track joining up, they're a completely different elevation. The upper one here is the lead from the ethanol yard and that just extends a few feet under the backdrop just to give a better tail track. It can go almost to the wall if it needs to, but an extra couple of feet is all we need. Uh, this track on the other hand can go all the way around under the ethanol plant all the way to the helix, making it long enough to stage a full train on it, allowing it to represent an interchange with another railroad. The ethanol plant is, I think, 19 feet long. It's certainly a good size. I was able to incorporate all the features of a full-size plant, although some of them still need to be selectively compressed. I found a video on YouTube that went through a guided tour of a plant, and I found that very useful for finding out what to include. I've included a short section of green belt between the ethanol plant and Midway. And here the main industry is the cement works. There's room for all the buildings from the Walters Valley cement. And since it's against the backdrop, we can open out some of the kit walls and make it look bigger. And then right next door to it, I've expanded it, suggesting a concrete pipe manufacturer, probably owned by the same company. Scrap yards are great industries for the front edge of the layout. In fact, I've got two on the layout, one, one at Midway and one at the Junction Yard, because they are so interesting. If we want to make one of them a general scrap merchant and the other one auto salvage, they can look very different. And one of them I have an extra dummy track running off the front of the layout, making it look as though it goes on a lot further. I suggest that a lumber yard in this corner also a good industry for the front edge of the layout because you don't need tall structures that have to be reached over and it allows for an extra car type in the form of centre beam flat cars. We've got a couple of, of food distributors which are very prevalent all up the west coast. I suggested a plastic pellets manufacturer. Another interesting industry incorporated on a layout owned by a friend of mine. It's served by two tracks. One of them receives petroleum and other chemicals in tank cars. The other track ships plastic pellets, both in bulk in jumbo covered hoppers and palletized in box cars. The next scene is the start of the double track main line. There is of necessity a few feet of overlap. Now, neither I nor the customer particularly like multiple main lines running through the same scene. It couldn't really be avoided at this point. So I've taken efforts to make sure they are at different levels and put a, a, de a fairly dense tree line between them so that if you're operating on one line, the other one is not going to draw attention to itself unless there's a train on it. Now this town here will be served by a local turn from the main yard. And this is the one location where I wasn't able to get a train length as long as I really wanted it. The arrival track here is limited to about 10 cars. So in order to make it look like a busy industrial area without overflowing the train length, I've added a sense of realism for the modern period and included some history. There are two industries here that are no longer rail served. And although the track and loading docks can still be there, the turnouts will have been removed. 
Thus, the available train length is not going to be oversubscribed by the remaining industries. You have another food distributor here, his white goods distributor, propane dealer, and team track along the front edge. I actually labeled it as a weed covered industry lead, rarely used, figuring there's another industry off stage here further from the main line, which is no longer rail served, but the lead to it still sees occasional use as a team track. Here we have our longest section of open scenery before the lines converge. At the main yard, there are a couple more um, history lessons included. We have the former freight house, which is now a tractor and yard machine distributor. It may still occasionally receive a flat calf with some tractors on it, or it might not be rail served, and the spur in front of it could be used by the railroad company for storing maintenance of way equipment. At the other end, I've shown the second route from the single track railroad company, the last few feet of it being abandoned and a bridge abutment here with the bridge having been removed. This piece of track here is still there because it serves as the lead for a propane dealer. I make no apologies for including two propane dealers on the layout. Where I used to live in Marquette, Michigan, there were three competing propane dealers and at least one of them was still rail served until a few years ago. Now, I mentioned earlier that he's going to be running weekend steam excursions. So the passenger depot is now restored and turned into a museum. And there is room for a couple of isolated lengths of track either side of it, which can be used for displaying out of date equipment. Some might already have been restored, others might be derelict and still awaiting restoration. Now, although our yard is small, it is difficult to justify both a steam roundhouse and a modern diesel shop. We managed to get around it by having the roundhouse become part of the railroad museum. Obviously, it'd be too dangerous to allow visitors to walk between the two, having to cross a, a busy double track main line. So a bus would be provided around from the depot to the roundhouse. Now he asked for a separate diesel shop. On the prototype, this probably wouldn't even be here. Refueling would be done on any available track and maintenance and regular inspections would be done elsewhere at some other major facility. But it's a model and I think it'll look okay. I've suggested that the original concrete coaling tower be still standing, although with all the metal work removed and sold for scrap, as was the fate of the ash plant, which is no longer there, even though the spur serving them can still be there. It would now either be used for parking diesels or storage of maintenance equipment. Uh, what else can I say about this plan? Oh, at both ends, the main line disappears not into a tunnel, but into brick canyons in the various city areas. The only visible tunnel on the layout is the one under here on the single track harbour branch. And these two tracks will just disappear into dense clumps of trees. Now, because the basement size may change slightly, it's more than likely that I'm going to have to redraw this plan at least one more time. And I already have a couple of changes in mind. Firstly, I'm thinking that the tank rack for loading ethanol here is a little on the short side. And I'd like to rearrange it so that it disappears behind the storage tanks and then curves round under the backdrop for a few more feet so that the two tracks between them can originate a full length block train. I think that'll be very interesting to do, especially as photographs of real ethanol plants that I've seen show mile long strings of tank cars. The other change that I really want to incorporate is with the container ship. After I completed the plan, I had a moment's misgivings. I'm not convinced that the sight lines will allow the subterfuge here to be completely invisible. It might be necessary to widen the benchwork here so we can include the full width of the ship. That will of course mean that the benchwork gets rather wide, but you don't have to reach across the back 18 inches because that's just hard and there's no track there. As long as the ship can be put into place, it shouldn't be necessary to reach in again after that.
Oh, one other thing to mention about the container ship, I deliberately had it facing towards the right. The name will be printed on the bow normally, and on the stern, the name and port of origin will be printed in mirror image. It will only ever be seen in the mirror, so it will represent a sister ship. Let's now have a look at the lower level. Here is the small rural town. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's completely separated from the main layout, so we can put something completely different here. And I thought of a fall scene with deciduous trees to contrast mainly conifers that are going to be on the main deck. We can have an abandoned depot here, a, an abandoned team track. I'm thinking that there can be a rural grain elevator and maybe a sugar beet uh, truck dump as still active industries. There can be a grade crossing with small town main street buildings and another opportunity for one more significant bridge. I split the auxiliary staging to allow room for a countertop in front of it. So this area can be used for serving refreshment to his guests and a small refrigerator, which may end up being under the counter, but if it's too tall, there's room to put it under the bench work there between the two parts of the staging yard. And if he still wants even more auxiliary staging, we can squeeze another one in here. But I think this is going to be enough. At this end of the aisle, I've included a work, a U-shaped work area, based very much along the lines of the one I had on my own layout, because he liked that, and shown where a spray booth can be put in next to it, and the main lines can just pass underneath the extractor fan. And we'll have it vented up through the walls to the outside. Anyway, I think that just about wraps up this layout design. Before signing off, let me just put up another view of the main level without all the annotations on it. It's a lot easier to see the trap plan here without it being defaced with all the labels. So I hope you've enjoyed this layout design presentation and I hope to see you again next week. Thanks for watching and bye for now.